It is August 15, 2009. Uh, the name of the show is called Historic Insights, and uh, the topic for today is uh, the great navigator and explorer John Cabot. Uh, first off, uh, I'd like to introduce to, to the audience uh, Mr. Ted Massano, a history expert, and he's, he's going to discuss the contributions that uh, John Cabot has made and the significance of his achievements. Um, first question, um, obviously uh, John Cabot uh, had a, a very significant uh, career as a navigator. Could you just tell us a little bit about uh, where he was born? Okay, and thank you for the introduction. Mm -hmm. Okay, well John Cabot, or the man we know as John Cabot, was reportedly born either in the northeastern maritime city of Genoa or in a suburb of Genoa called Gaeta, G-A-E-T-A. We actually don't know where because there are no documents, but it's generally assumed and accepted that he was born in Genoa or a suburb named Gaeta around 1450. There are no birth certificates. His discovery of the New World, could you just uh, give us a brief uh, uh, synopsis of uh, his discovery and the significance of it? Be glad to. In the year 1497, in May of that year, the man we call John Cabot, uh, his, his original name, Italian name, was and is Giovanni Cabotto, C-A-B-O-T-O. But the anglicized version, we know him as is John Cabot, and that's the name he used and was used for him in England after he went there looking for uh, financial support for his voyages in 1495. John Cabot made uh, his first voyage, he tried, in 1496 with one ship. It was an aborted voyage. He had problems with supplies, mutinous crew, and other problems, and had to turn back. However, he was uh, incidentally granted what they call letters patent, P-A-T-E-N-T, -E from the reigning monarch of England at that time, King Henry VII of the Tudor dynasty. And in May 1497, John Cabot attempted a second voyage with more additional letters patent from Henry VII. He left Bristol Harbor in that month and he headed north in northern latitudes in the North Atlantic, going past Iceland, Greenland, until sometime in August, possibly August 15th, 1497, he made landfall in what we now know today as North America. It's not known for sure. There's some dispute as to where he exactly landed, but it was either Labrador, Nova Scotia, or kept Cape Breton Island. I believe that the Canadians and the British believe it was most likely somewhere in Nova Scotia. Now, I should say also there are some people, some scholars that think he might have even landed in Maine, but it's most likely one of those three, possibly Nova Scotia. Uh, then then he, he planted the flags of England, of King Henry VII, of Venice, of which he was a citizen, and of the Vatican, of the papacy, because he had papal authorization for, uh, or he wanted to show that he had authorization for his voyage from the highest religious authority at the time, which was the uh, Roman Catholic papacy, was before the Reformation. In terms of his strategy, it was uh, more lo uh, northern latitude that he, that he uh, uh, attempted this um, yes. uh, uh, voyage. Mm -hmm. What was his thinking, and was it, was it correct thinking in terms of... Uh, a strategy to get to North America uh, quicker? Well, first of all, answer both questions. Yes, he did that. Yes, it was correct thinking. Why was that? Because John Cabot was uh, an expert mariner. He was an expert map maker, map, map maker. And he had studied enough of the ancient medieval documents, everything available, the scholars of the time, a famous Italian scholar named Toscanelli from Florence, who Columbus also had studied. Um, the, these guys, Columbus and Cabot, had grown up together or close by in uh, Genoa, and they recognized Toscanelli as a scholar. He made a famous map, Toscanelli map. But according to what I understand, John Cabot 
was aware, of course, of Columbus's first voyage and his other voyages, this up to 1497, I think it was, there were two or three voyages by that time, too. And John Cabot believed that he could get across the Atlantic Ocean faster on a northerly route. Columbus took a southerly route because he knew that the longitudes at the top of the globe of the planet are smaller than at the middle. For example, this is the equator. Longitude, if you look on any map, goes right up like that and gets smaller and smaller to the top. Latitude goes straight ahead. John Cabot was aware of this. He took that chance, he took the voyage, and he was prove, proven to be right. Because he made the voyage in pretty good time, uh, August, uh, let's see, May to August. So it was approximately 15 days to get to North America, excuse me, 30 days to get to North America. Which was America, pretty good at that time. And 15 days to return yes. back to uh, um, It was a good, it was a, a good time. That would be your answer. Okay. Uh, can can you describe um, uh, the ship? Uh, the the uh, Matthew was the ship that um, uh, that he embarked on this uh, voyage. Uh, it was state of the art um, in terms of uh, technology. Um, it wasn't that uh, large, but there were a lot no. of, of, of of advanced uh, technology involved in for the time. Could you tell us a little bit about the ship? How good it was? What its strong points? What its weak points were? Okay, I'll do my best. The ship that John Cabot took from Bristol to the New World, as I said, Nova Scotia, Labrador, Baffin Island, was named the Matthew. It was named undoubtedly after his wife, who was an Italian Venetian citizen whose first name was Matea, which is the feminine Italian for Matthew. Named the ship after his wife. The ship was built in the shipyards of Bristol, and at that time, Bristol was a top-rate shipbuilding community. That was the top port in England for shipping, and well, maritime shipping, Bristol. It's probable that John Cabot oversaw the, the construction of the ship, or at least was involved in the construction of the ship. He knew a lot about shipbuilding too, apparently. He knew many, many things. The ship was called a bark, B-A-R-K smaller than the caravel ships that you might know. Columbus had, I think, one caravel and two, two other ships. But it was very what is small. What is caravel? It's a type it's a of ship? It's a bigger ship okay. with uh, a bigger version. The bark is much smaller, and uh, I believe it may have an extra mast. I'll have to check. There's a picture of it here. In any event, the ship was small. had a crew of 18, and... Uh, Besides that, he had his a uh, priest, one of his best friends, and his personal barber from, I think, Venice. That was it. He may have had his son on, one of his sons, probably Sebastiano or Sebastian, but it's not for sure that we know that. The ship itself was a very seaworthy ship by all accounts that we have. It made the trip. It came back. Uh, one thing about the ship, I should say, though, we don't have any records of the ship itself. Only some verbal descriptions of what a bark looked like at the time. There's no records, of course no pictures. So they recreated this ship in, in 1997 for the, in, in Bristol for the 300th anniversary, uh, was it, no, I'm sorry, the 500th anniversary and, of John Cabot's uh, and the ship, voyage. A picture of the ship is uh, right here. And yes. Maybe you could just uh, take a look and give us a little description of it. Okay. Uh, well, the ship, it does have three masts. I, I said wrong on that. But something to do with the way the sails are. For example, I think I could tell you. See the large uh, mid, mid, middle or mid uh, mast, and these are the four nav masses. On the caravel, I believe Santa Maria was, they would have another sail here. He didn't have that extra sail. But it was a very seaworthy ship by all accounts, and you can see the replica floating in Bristol Harbor uh, right now. Some of the records indicate that the technology used for um, caulking the ship was uh, state of the art. They used a, a cotton fiber. Yes. And um, previously it was a, a hemp and um, a tar hemp.